Good morning, church. I'd like to invite your attention to the book of Job, Job chapter number three. Job chapter number three. As you make your way there, I wanted to express my sincerest gratitude to my brother and friend, uh, Pastor Achan, for this uh, privilege he has extended to me again to open God's word. This is something I do not take uh, for granted. Job chapter number three. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job said, let the day perish on which I was born. And the night that said, a man is conceived. Let the day be darkness. May God above not seek it. No light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Behold, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry enter it. Let those cursed who curse the day, who are ready to rouse up Leviathan, let the stars of his dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none. Nor see the eyelids of the morning, because it not shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. Verse 11. Why did I not die at birth? Come out from the womb and expire. Why did the knees receive me? Or why the breast that I should nurse? For then I would have lain down and been quiet. I would have slept, then I would have been at rest with kings and counselors of the earth who rebelled ruins for themselves, or with princes who had God who filled their houses with silver. Or why was I not as a hidden stillborn child? as infants who never see the light. There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners are at ease together. They hear not the voice of the taskmaster. The small and the great are there, and the slave is free from his master. Why is light given to him who is in misery, and life to the bitter in soul? Who long for death, but it comes not, and dig for it more than for hidden treasures, who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? For my sign comes instead of my bread, and my groanings are poured out like water. For the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease. Nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. Let's ask the Lord for his help and blessing. Heavenly Father, here is your word, and here are your people. This is not an easy word, but I pray, Lord, that you help me. As I open my mouth, what comes out of my mouth, Lord, may it be your very word. May you guide me, Lord, against error. May I be your mouthpiece. But I pray, Lord, that somebody may be encouraged this morning. Somebody, Lord God, may be comforted this morning. And where necessary, somebody may be corrected. Lord, we ask this for our good but ultimately for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say? Amen. In 1993, my dear, beautiful mother died. I was 11 years old. My young brother was seven years old, and I had a brother who is a year older than me. He was only 12. 
My mother meant everything to me. I was raised by her while my father was living and working in South Africa. When she died, my two siblings and I had no choice but to go join our father, whom we barely knew. All his life, even to this day, my father has been an alcoholic. After a month of my mother's burial, a woman came to Malawi and introduced herself to me and my siblings as your new mother. A month after we buried our mother. Now if you do the math, it means this woman was married to our father while our mother was not only alive, but struggling with her health. Life in South Africa with our stepmother, I may call it hell on earth to say the least. We've some days been better than others, of course. But safe to say, my childhood left a lot of emotional tumor. I still remember going to school, it was very painful in a sense that during lunch break, I would sometimes hide in the bathrooms because I didn't want anyone to ask me, why are you not eating? Because my, our stepmother would give her children money for lunch and not give me and my siblings money for lunch. And my father, as I mentioned, he has been an alcoholic and only cared for number one, that for himself. And this frustrated my stepmother and she took that frustration on me and my siblings. Life was difficult and many times I thought of just taking my own life. And at age 16, I was forced to leave home and fend for myself on the streets. This experience remains painful, but I want to let you know this cannot be compared to what Job is describing in Job chapter number three. The first two chapters of Job, this we may call Job's crown jewel, where we see Job losing all that mattered to him. He lost his children, he lost his wealth, but he responded by saying, naked I came from this world, naked I shall be depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken. Blessed be the name of the Lord. After he lost all that mattered to him, he responded by worshiping God. And chapter 2, we see what Job is not aware of, where there was a conversation between God the Father and Satan himself. And after he lost his children and lost his wealth, Satan goes again to God. And God gives him permission to go back to Job. And he afflicts Job now with sores, with his health. And at this time, Job's wife gives him some advice. She says, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Job, why don't you end this? Now, before we throw stones at Job's wife, you need to remember this woman had just lost 10 children. She was living with Job. This passage that I just read, chapter 3, if you're looking for instructions, they are not there. There's no commandments. The passage does not tell us what to do. But what is there is the heart. The heart of a man in misery. 
You see, brothers and sisters, Job chapter 3, do you know why Job chapter 3 is in the Bible? Job chapter 3 is in the Bible so that Job can ask the why question. Mind you, you and I know what Job is going through. Why Job is going through what he's going through. Job did not know that. He did not know what is going on. And many times, the why question is actually triggered by meaningless or unexplained suffering. He's going through severe affliction. He does not know why that is going on. I never understood why I had to lose my dear, beautiful mother at that young age. In fact, that has always been difficult for me, at least growing up, when I would hear someone who says, Mom. And I personally get angry at those who, are, who still have their mothers, but take them from, for granted. Again, what I want you to see here is for Job, he is a man that God himself has called an upright and blameless man. But now he's beginning to ask questions. But we need to place this in the right framework. At no point does Job abandon his faith. Even the passage our brother read in James chapter 5, Job is being commended for his steadfastness. At no point did, he, did he, he accept his wife's advice to kiss God. And it's because I believe Job knew God to be there, to be loving, to be just. Even, I just love how we're greeting each other. God is good. God is what? Good. But we don't just say God is good. Where we come from, we say he's good. And we say all the time. We don't only say all the time. We say that is his nature. But it's easy for us to be able to say that when all things are going smooth. Now here's Job. He's asking for an explanation. But I want you to know that all his struggles, the struggles of Job, these are struggles of a believer. And this should remind us no one is immune to struggles. And this should also remind us, and I believe this was God's intent. It is so us that a human being can love God, fear God, pursue righteousness, yet still be aff afflicted with trials. This is why those who think or teach that if you come to Christ, all your problems will be solved. I don't know what they'll do with Job chapter number three. So if you know, if you want to know where we're going, I have for us three responses in dealing with despair. Three responses in dealing with despair so that you will not be in despair. So, first response is that we are not to, we are not to question God's plan. We are not to question God's plan. This is what we see in verses 1 to 10. What is happening here? Job is questioning God. He's cursing God's plan. He's saying, God's plan was for me to be born. And he's saying, I want nothing to do with that. He's questioning God. Why was I even born? Listen to the beautiful way he expresses that in verse uh, number one. How does he put it? It says, let the day perish. Let the day perish on which I was born. And the night that said a man child is conceived. He's saying, let that day be darkness. 
May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. What's happening here? Job is looking back to the day of his birth. And although he cannot change that, he's saying, may the anniversary of it be ignored. Let it be a day that is darkened. Let no one rejoice in it. Now, if it was God's plan for Job to be born, what is going on here is that Job is questioning God's plan. That's what is going on here. Look at verse 10. Why is the question in this? Look at the purpose statement. Look at the word because. The reason Job gives for this outcry in verse 10 says, because I was born on that day it produced me. Who caused Job to be born? God. So he's questioning God's plan. Look at verse 10 again. It says, because it not shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. He's now longing for death. After all that he has enjoyed from God, he now comes close to cursing God, but thankfully he never does. He's only cursing the day of his birth. He's not cursing God himself as the wife suggested he should, but he's cursing the day of his birth and by extension what he's doing, he's questioning God's plan. Friends, I do not think anything is harder for us to bear than unexplained trouble. He is asking, why was I born? So since it is God who determines whether you are born or not, Job here is attacking God himself. Look at verse 7. Job is saying, Behold, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry enter it. Again, Job here is not seeking to take his life. Suicide is not an option. Although some commentators will say Job was here suicidal, I want to disagree with that because if Job wanted to take his own life, who was stopping him? Nothing was stopping him. However, he wishes he was never born in the first place. It says, cursed be the day of his birth. Now, Job's patience that we saw in chapter 1 and chapter 2 has become Job's despondency. Verse 8 is probably the lowest moment. Or as you say in this place, hitting rock bottom. Look at verse 8. It says, let those curse it who curse the day, who are ready to rouse up Le Leviathan. You know what's happening here? Job is invoking the magicians to wipe or blot out the day of his birth. He's even seeking the control of the monsters of the sea. But again, this doesn't fit, does it? doesn't feed you for to know about Job, who is a man that is upright, a man that fears God. So if you're looking for what the Leviathan is, whether these are dinosaurs or not, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell you, you ask your pastor. But here, what are you saying? Job is wishing for the day he was born to be wiped out. Look at verse 9. It says, let the stars of his dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none. Nor see the eyelids of the morning, because it not shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. He's kissing the day he was born. I remember as if it was yesterday, but 27 September 2017, I received a text that my wife 
is going to the hospital as she's having what is suspected of labor pains. This was two weeks from her due date. She was in South Africa and I was in Malawi. And I went to the airline and I asked them, can I fly today? You should have seen my face. I was told how much I need to pay for me to change my ticket. In protest, I walked away from the airline. I'm like, I thought I already paid for this ticket, so why are you charging this much money? I went home in protest. But when I was at home, I was just not at peace. I went back this time, I packed my bag, I went home. Excuse me, I went back to the airline. How much did you say I must pay again? I paid, I went straight to the airport. And I asked a friend to pick me up at an airport in South Africa and take me straight to the hospital where my wife was suspected to be in labor. And God's providence, this friend who picked me up, it just happens that he was actually celebrating his own birthday with his family. And I called him and he came to pick me up. He took me to the hospital. When I got to the hospital, they said only one guardian is allowed and your wife is with her mother. I said, you know what, nurse, go tell the mother to come out. I'm the guardian. I went inside the labor ward. This was the first time. I never experienced this. I was shocked. I'm seeing these men doctors with my wife there. What's going on here? Suffice to say, about 10, 15 minutes later, our son popped up. I will always cherish, I always rejoice in this day. So I'm surprised that Job is cursing the day that he was born. But do you know why we were born? Job himself tells us, if you can just turn two pages in your Bible, Job chapter 5 verse 7. Job is saying, I wish I was not born. But why is anyone born in the first place? Let Job answer the question himself. Job 5 verse 7. But man is born for what? For? For trouble. As the sparks fly away. Job can't handle God's plan. But the reality is this, brothers and sisters, when things don't go well, we should not be surprised. We should be surprised when things go well. Because man is born for trouble. We stand, we should, we must be still be able to say it is well with my soul. We're born for trouble. Maybe let me ask you, what plan of God are you questioning right now? In a room this size, I only believe that you may be in still questioning God's plan. Maybe you're questioning God about the person you're married to, or your children, your in-laws, how you look, your job, your church, your station in life. But the problem is this. Many times we obscure the memories or the joy, the goodness of God when we face difficulties. Maybe you might be there this morning, but you see the reality is this, it's either right now you are going through a trial, or you are coming from a trial, or you are going into a trial. You just choose one. Job is not the only one who cares God in the Bible, is, there, is he? Maybe there's comfort numbers, but even the prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, you know what he said in Jeremiah 20, verse 14, says, cursed be the day which I was born. May the day when my mother gave birth to me not be blessed. And in chapter 15, Jeremiah said this, Jeremiah 15, verse 10 says, woe to me that you have given birth to me as a man of strife and a man of contention to all the land. I have not lent, nor have people lent money to me, yet everyone curses me. Here is a man that went through afflictions. He had a ministry that saw no converts. So he's called the weeping prophet. 
But history tells us this man was faithful. This was a, a true prophet of God. But even him, he's cursing the day of his birth. So, not only did Job question God's plan, by questioning why he was born in verses 1 to 10. Let's move on to the second point. Second point. Verses 11 to 19. How do you respond to despair? Don't question God's plan. Second, don't question God's purpose. So, verse 11, look at verse 11. Why did I not die? Stop there. God's plan was for Job to be born, right? We agree on that. And because he didn't die, we can conclude that God must have had a purpose for, for, for him. And then he's saying, if God allowed me to live, if he has a purpose for me, I don't like it. So verse 11, you see, he's questioning God's purpose. How so, you may ask. Job is saying, why didn't I die at birth? Well, he didn't die because God did not allow you to die. And if you didn't die, it's because he has a purpose for your life. Look at verse 12. Why did the knees receive me? If you know your Old Testament, or if you know the Jewish culture, the knees, this is a reference to the Father. You see, in Genesis chapter 48, when Jacob is about to die, he blesses his children, and then he brings even Joseph's son and puts them in his knee. That's another way of embracing them. And he's saying, Job is saying, why did the knees receive me? Why was I embraced at birth? Verse 13, he's saying, I should have been addressed if I didn't have this life today. And verse 14 and 14 says, I would have been of kings, I would have been of counselors, with princes, verse 15, who lived it up on earth, but now it is. Job is saying there's people who are just living for themselves. When they die, they are at ease, they are at rest. I should be with those people. I don't want to live anymore. I just want to be at ease. Job is questioning God's purpose. May I remind you again, Job is not aware about exchange in heaven between God and Satan. So no wonder he's asking, what is the purpose of this test? What is the purpose of this trial? Is there any reason why I'm going through this? If you... Re if you, you were listening to the Bible study earlier on, book of our Philippians. We saw that Paul, of all that he went through, in chapter 1, verse 12, you know what he said? He said this, referring to the imprisonment, what did he call it? It does what? Saved to advance the gospel. About three years ago, three years ago, I don't know if I shared this to your pastor, but three years ago, I was driving my daughter to Somo, some of you met her last time we were together. I was dropping her to school, and I was involved in a tragic car accident. Three children died. I was thrown in prison because I was charged with manslaughter. When what happens to me, what, what happened to me happens, you are usually charged with cause of death by accident. I was thrown together with murderers, sodomists. If I say I feared for my life, that would be an understatement. The emotional torture that three children lost their lives because of my driving was heavy to bear. It remains heavy to bear today. I don't know what God was doing with all this. People came to see me. One of them is a Sam Shaw that I came with. He's the one who started even driving my wife to come see me in prison. 
People come to me and out of uh, care for me, most people tell me, it is going to be okay. You're going to come out. This was an accident. But someone else helped me to begin to leave while I was in prison. You know what he told me? And I'll confess to you, I didn't like what he said to me first. But he said this. Newton, you are exactly where God wants you to be. When I heard those words, I began to live in the prison cell. I began to talk to people, people that were bitter, people that were wrongly accused of crimes they did not commit. I know of this one young man, he was actually wrongly accused of defilement. He was angry, bitter. I shared the gospel with him. He was acquitted in court. Long story short, he came to our church. I baptized him. He's a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. How was I going to meet him? While I was in prison, they start asking me, what do you do? So usually when someone asks me, Newton, what do you do? I don't like to say I'm a pastor. Because the moment you say a pastor, people are already on their guard. So I try to be, I don't want to lie, of course. I, I try to be not too smart so that I can get away with things. So that, what do you do? I say, I write sermons. <laughs> usually I'm hoping somebody will just leave it at there, that this guy maybe is a writer. But sometimes I ask, what do you do with the sermons? No, I preach them. Oh, so you're a pastor. <laughs> so when they found out in prison I was a pastor, they started asking me to preach. So as I was preaching, I'll preach. And the more I'm preaching, I was getting more invitations to preach. And the guy who was involved with uh, organizing uh, the services in prison, he said, Newton, your preaching is different. And what he meant is that most of the preaching in prison, someone will come and say, we're going to go out, we're going to go out, we're going to go out. And I'll stand and preach and say, Yes, we may go out, but I want to remind you, even if you go out, but if you do not know Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior, there are ways for you a bigger, heavier prison that will be there for all eternity. So as I was getting more invitation to preach, this guy who was in charge of all the services, he said, Newton, why don't you help these guys who are preaching, teach them how to preach? Then I said, okay, not a problem. And I, I, I said, guys, if you're interested for me to help you just to put together a sermon, I'm happy to do that. About 15, 20 people sign up. Then I asked uh, some friends to bring me the, the books. I think I asked for 20 books because it was about 15 that had signed up. The day I started teaching this, 60 men showed up in prison. And I'm saying all this to say, I realized indeed I was exactly where God wanted me to be. And that is, helped me to understand, my brother, my sister, don't waste your pain. There's always a purpose why God brings us whatever he brings us. Usually it is to serve a purpose. A purpose that is greater than ourselves. And our brother Job here, he did not know all that. That's why he's questioning God's purpose. He's saying, Job is saying, my life has been meaningless. It would have been better if I wasn't born. Now that he's born, he says, it's been better if I died at my birth. But why didn't, Job, why didn't God take Job's life? Because God had a purpose for Job. Job's suffering was tremendous. But worse than that, there seemed to be no end in sight. So his pain, to his pain, and things not getting any better. Because even by this time, his friends have come, but they're just quiet. The pain was so unbearable. And you could paraphrase what Job is saying. He said, just kill me and get it over with. Job is not trying to take his life, but he's hoping God will take his life. You know, Job, 
says, chapter 19, verse 25, he knows his Redeemer lives. He had confidence in God, but even though he had that, it was still painful for him, so much so that he wished he would die. Again, you see, unexplained suffering, when it seems to be meaningless, it's difficult for us to bear that. I don't know where you are at this morning. I don't know what you may be going through, but I'm here to encourage you. There's always a purpose to why you go through what you go through. There's a reason why you are here this morning. That is why it is important for us to learn to hold on to our faith when we are in what man, one man calls it God's waiting room. Where we're waiting for answers or some relief, but they don't just come. Reminds me of that young man who was on fire for the Lord. The Lord seemed to have been with him and he faced some trials and difficulties, and now he was protesting, Lord, I could see that when all things were well, you're with me, because there were some steps that were traced. But when things were difficult, he only saw one footsteps. And the Lord said, no, those, one foot, those footsteps were mine. I was holding you. Are you in God's waiting room right now? We have looked at how to respond to trial. Don't question God's plan. Don't question God's purpose. Third and last, don't question God's pity. Look at verse 21. I simply mean God's compassion. Why does God keep alive someone who is suffering? Verse 20. See that verse 20? Why does God give light? Why does God keep somebody who's suffering? Why does God still give this person life? You know why? Because the compassionate God. He's a God of pity. He's a God of love. Look at verse 23. Here's a question in the book of Job. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? Do you remember anywhere else that you came across this word hedged? Satan was telling God, the reason Job is an upright man, the reason Job is blameless is because you have put a hedge around him. This refers to protection. Now Job is saying, I've been hedged in. Now God has hedged me in. That's why I'm facing all these afflictions. And then he's saying, why is light given to one in misery? Then follows a somewhat astonishing admission. Verse 25 to 26. It says, what I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. You see that? Why does God not give death to those who want it? That's what Job is asking. The answer is because he's a God of compassion. He's a God of goodness. Don't question his pity. If you are still sitting here, you still have your breath, even though you may have afflictions, you need to be reminded that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And again, God does not blame us. God does not get weary like I do. Sometimes when my children ask me their why question, I said, my child, Grace, can you please go do that? Why? Well, I'm a dad, so do what I'm telling you. <laughs> but God is not 
like sin for me, right? He's okay when we ask the why question. But do you know there's a problem with the why question? The problem with the why question is this. By focusing upon the why question, Job begins to lose the proper perspective he had earlier. And also, when you go through the book of Job, you realize God does not promise to answer the why question. He, has not, he doesn't promise you to answer it. But Job he is repeatedly asking the why question. But again, he's asking this why question because he does not know the reason behind all his trials. But at the end, you see this. Asking the why question, brother, sister, is not necessarily a sin. At least, it is not a sin to ask the why question if you are prepared to accept God's answer. The answer God gives. The answer Job gets in the end can only satisfy those who are willing to understand God's mysterious ways through the eyes of faith. Because when God shows up and answers Job's question, you know what God, Job, what God says? Job, where were you when I created this world? Where were you? You know what is Job's response according to the Bible? The Bible says Job did this. But how did Job feel? Because you see chapters later, his friends who have done the best thing they could have done by just keeping quiet. They start opening their mouths. What are they saying now? They begin to accuse Job, right? Job, this has happened to you because there must be sin in your life. He's now being insulted by man. And he feels abandoned by God. Does anyone come to mind who was insulted by man and abandoned by his father in heaven? Jesus. He was insulted by man and abandoned by God. Yet he kept his purpose alive. Jesus knew he came to seek and save that which was lost. This is why in the book of Mark, when he began to reveal his identity, he asked his disciples, who do people say? I am. And what do they say? Some say you are John the Baptist. Some say you are Elijah. Then he turned the question, but you, who do you say that I am? And Peter, as a spokesperson, what does he say? You are you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now that this is out, now that my identity is out, you guys, you know, I am the Messiah. What does it do? Let me explain what this means for you. He says, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be killed. Are you still willing to follow? What did Peter do? He takes Jesus. He has just said he's the Messiah, right? He takes him aside and he... He's rebuking. Who is he rebuking? Why? Because suffering was not what he thought following Jesus Christ entails. But my brother, my sister, if you're going to follow Jesus Christ the way he wants to be followed, I can promise you, I can guarantee you, you are not greater than your master. This is part and parcel of following Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ himself, he says, the way for me for the Messiah is that of rejection, suffering, and death, and I will rise again. And he says you are to deny yourself, carry your cross, and follow me daily. So, what should we say in response to such suffering? There are three takeaways here. First, Job is correct not to curse God or blame God for what has happened to him. 
by resisting the temptation to do so, Job passes the trial and frustrates the purposes of the real enemy, that is the devil himself. And second, Job as a prophet, Job's own obedience points us ahead to the perfect obedience of Jesus Christ, who is the ground of Job's own justified status before God. And said in all this, Job is an example to us in our own suffering. Following God does not make you immune to trials. But we know how the story of Job ends, right? After all this, there's a restoration to all that he lost. But more than just that, there's a restoration between the relationship of Job and God. And have you noticed that in all the book of Job, he never, not once complained about the stuff that he lost. I hope all this will help us to understand that this, as much as led Job to ask the right question, yet Jesus Christ himself, he redeems the right question. Because Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew chapter number 27, you know what he says? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This means Jesus sanctifies the way right question. And what is more, the one who hears and answers our prayers is a fellow sufferer. That's why the author of Hebrews, what does he say? He's able to sympathize with us. Brother, sister, don't think you're all by yourself. There's nothing that is unique to you. Whatever you face is not unbearable because we have a savior who has gone through far ways than you and I will ever go through, yet him without sin. Suffering comes before glory. When Peter was rebuking Jesus Christ, he was trying to say, you know what? You can have the crown without the cross. But that's not how it works. So in the midst of trial, I don't know what trial you may be facing. Maybe it's a difficult marriage. Maybe it's an illness. It is perfectly okay, perfectly okay to open your hearts and cry out in anguish as did Job. But you must know before you ask, why? That you may not get the answer until you cross into glory. I may not have the answer why I lost my mother when I was 11. But I look back at the same woman I so despised as my stepmother. I realized God used that woman in his sovereign providence to rescue me and my brothers, to go to South Africa where we were able to get later on education, which we probably would not have gotten if we remained in Malawi. God's ways are mysterious. When we face difficulties, let's be reminded there's always a purpose behind those. But I don't know where you are. Question is, do you know this, Lord? Have you repented of your sins and put your trust in Jesus Christ? Have you come to faith in Jesus Christ? Are you waiting for a perfect time? Behold, today is the day of the Lord. Tomorrow is the devil's day. Whoever you are, wherever you are, seek the Lord while you may be found. If you have already crossed the line of faith, if you are already following Christ, I want to tell you, you have begun the most beautiful journey on this earth. Yes, there may be some valleys, there will be some difficulties, but if you know Christ, you can be able to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Father, thank you for this uh, word. I pray you may continue to use it long 
after I've stopped speaking. Thank you, Lord God, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your love. I pray that, Lord, your people will be encouraged, your people will be strengthened. Thank you for the work you're doing here. Thank you for my dear brother and friend, uh, Pastor Chan. Encourage him, strengthen him, even as he continues to lead your flock. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people say? Thank you, Brother Newton, for really a word in due season for all of us. You know, just a just reflection. It's so wonderful to have God to be with us through Jesus, no matter what we're in. And one of the, just one of the memorable uh, things that uh, Brother Newton said was, you know, we are either in distress or coming out of distress only to look forward to the next distress. We need to remember that when we are in our next episode of distress. But I just want to underscore one thing that, that uh, Pastor Tilling Gulo said, and that is that if you don't know God, there is coming a day where all the small trials that you live in this life will seem like nothing when you stand be- before God without an advocate. You know you need Jesus. Even in the trials of life, without an advocate by your side, you suffer torment and you know that you can't handle it. What will you do in the day when you stand before God? The Christian life is not easy. But if we have the Savior by our side, we, we can be more than victorious and triumphant through Jesus. Even through the valley of the shadow of death, we won't fear the evil because the Lord is with us. And the Lord needs to be with you, you who do not know God. You need Jesus. You need his advocacy because he died for you on the cross to pay for your sins, to save you from the day so that you won't have to stand before God. You will be redeemed. You'll be covered. So if you're not saved, if you don't, have your sins forgiven, and you don't know God through the Lord Jesus, I want you to come and talk to myself or Pastor Mello or Pastor Chilingulo, and you need Jesus. Don't, don't leave this auditorium before you talk about your soul. Let's all stand, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you used our, our brother indeed to be your mouthpiece this morning, to speak to our souls. We need to hear this. We need to remember that you're in control and whatever you have designed, we will receive it by your grace, God, and to your glory. And we'll be that witness in that place, no matter how hard it is. Use us, God. But I pray for those also who do not know you, Lord, that they would find salvation for their soul through the Lord Jesus. Speak to them now and show them their sin and draw them to Jesus. I pray that they would speak to to a counselor, God, speak to one of the pastors this morning and that you would work in them to will and do, their good, do your good pleasure by giving them repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. Repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus. We pray that you would bless the food they're about to eat, the fellowship. Lord, that you would be pleased, your face would shine upon us as we give you all the glory. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.